Section 12. Ingersoll's Lecture on Talmagian Theology. Number 2 and 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ingersoll's Second and Third Lecture on Talmagian Theology from the book Lectures of Colonel Robert Green Ingersoll, Volume 2. Colonel Ingersoll began, Only a few years ago the pulpit was almost supreme. The palace was almost in the shadow of the cathedral, and the power behind every throne was a priest. Man was held in physical slavery by kings, and in a mental prison by the church. He was allowed to hold no opinions as to where he came from, nor as to where he was going. It was sufficient for him to do the labor and believe the kings would do the governing, and the priests the thinking. And my God, what thinking! If the world had obeyed the priests, we would all be idiots tonight. The eagle of intellect would have given way to the blind bat of faith. They were the rack, the faggot, the thumbscrew in this world, and hell in the next. Only a few years ago no man could express an honest thought unless he agreed with the church. The church has been a perpetual beggar. It has never plowed, it never sowed, it never spun, yet Solomon in all his glory was not so arrayed. Thanks to modern thought, the brain of the nineteenth century, to Voltaire, Paine, Hume, to all the free men, that beggar, the church, is no longer upon horseback, and it fills me with joy to state that even its walking is not now good. Only a little while ago a priest was thought more than human. Nobody dared contradict the minister. Now there are other learned professions. There are doctors, lawyers, writers, books, newspapers, and the priest has hundreds of rivals. The priest grew jealous, hateful. He was always thankful for an epidemic or pestilence so that people would turn to him in despair. In our country all the men of intellect were in the pulpit once. Now there are so many avenues to distinction, the men of brain, heart, and red blood have left the pulpit and gone to useful things. I do not say all, there are still some men of mind in the pulpit, but they are nearer infidels than any other. Where do we get our ministers? A young man without constitution enough to be wicked, without health enough to enjoy the things of this world, naturally fixes his gaze on high. He is educated, sent to a university, where he is taught that it is criminal to think. Stuffed with a creed, he comes out a shepherd. Most of them are intellectual shreds and patches, mental ravelings, selvage. Every pulpit is a pillory in which stands a convict. Every member of the church stands over him with a club called a creed. He is an intellectual slave and dare not preach his honest thought. There are thousands of good men in the pulpit, honest men. I am simply describing the average shepherd. They tell me they've been called, that Almighty God selected them. He looked all over the world and said, Now there's a man I want. And what selections! Shakespeare was not called, yet he has done more for this world than all the ministers who have ever lived in it. Beethoven! He was not called. Raphael was not called. He was all an accident. All the inventors, discoverers, poets, God never called one of them. He turned his attention to popes, cardinals, priests, exhorters, and what selections he has made, it is astonishing. In the United States a great many ministers have been good enough to take me for a text, among others the Reverend Mr. Talmadge of Brooklyn. I have nothing to say about his reputation. 
It has nothing to do with the question. Some ministers think he has more gesticulation than grace. Some call him a pious pantaloon, a Christian clown, but such remarks, I think, are born of envy. He is the only Presbyterian minister in the United States who can draw an audience. He stands at the head of the denomination, and I answer him. He's a strange man. I believe he's orthodox, or intellectual pride would prevent his saying these things. He believes in a literal resurrection of the dead, that we shall see countless bones flying through the air. He has some charges against me, and he has denied some of my statements. He has produced what he calls arguments, and I am going to answer some of the charges. Next Sunday afternoon at two o'clock in this place, I shall have a matinee and answer his arguments. He says I am the champion blasphemer. What is blasphemy? To contradict a priest? To have a mind of your own? Whoever takes a step in advance is a blasphemer. Blasphemy is what a last year's leaf says to a this year's bud. To deny that Mohammed is the prophet of God is not blasphemy in New York. It is in Constantinople. It is a question, then, largely of geography. It depends on where you are. The missionary who laughs at a modern god is a blasphemer. In a Catholic country, whoever says Mary is not the mother of God is a blasphemer. In a Protestant country, to say she is the mother of God is blasphemy. Everything has been blasphemy. My doctrine is this. He is a blasphemer who refuses to tell his honest thought, who is not true to himself, who enslaves his fellow man, who charges that God was once in favor of slavery. If there is any God, that man is a blasphemer. They're afraid we'll injure God. How? Is infinite goodness and mercy to become livid with wrath because a finite being expresses an opinion? I cannot help the infinite. That man only is the good man who helps his fellow man. I know them who would do anything for God who doesn't need it, but nothing for men who do need it. Why should God be so particular about my believing his book? It's no more his work than the stars of gravitation. Yet I may declare that the earth is flat, and he'll not damn me for that. But if I make a mistake about that book, I'm gone. I can blaspheme the multiplication table and deify the power of the wedge. In fact, the less I know, the better my chance will be. I say that book is not inspired, and there is no infinitely good God who will damn one human soul. At the judgment, if I am mistaken, I own up. I am here. I do not know where I came from, nor where I am going. I'll be honest about it. I am on a ship, and not on speaking terms with the captain. But I propose to have a happy voyage, and the best way is to do what you can to make your fellow passengers happy. If we run into a good port, I'll be as happy an angel as you'll meet that day. Blasphemy is the cry of a defeated priest, the black flag of theology. It shows where argument stops and slander and persecution begin. I am told by Mr. Talmadge that whoever contradicts this word is a fool, a howling wolf, one of the assassins of God. I presume the gentleman is honest. Take Mr. Talmadge now. He is a good man. Mr. Humboldt, he was another good man. What Humboldt knew and what Talmadge didn't know would make a library. The next charge is that I have said the universe was made of nothing according to the Bible. False in one thing, false in all, he says. Think of that rule. Let us apply that to man. If the world was created, what was it made of? 
And who made that? If the Lord created it, what did he make it of? Nothing. That's all he had. No sides, no top, nothing. Yet God had lived there forever. What did he think about? What did he do? Nothing. Nothing had ever happened. All at once he made something. What did he make it of? Mr. Talmadge explains. He says, if I knew anything, I would know that God made this world out of his omnipotence. He might just as well have made it out of his memory. What is omnipotence? Is it a raw material? The weakest man in the world can lift as much nothing as God. Yet he made this world out of his omnipotence. It is so stated by a doctor of divinity, and I should think such divinity would need a doctor. I don't believe this. I don't believe this universe has existed throughout all eternity, everything. All that is, is God. I do not give to that universe a personality that wants man to get his knees into dust and his fingers in holy water, that wants somebody to ring a bell or eat a wafer. I am a part of this universe, and I believe all there is is all the God there is. I may be mistaken, I don't know. I just give my best opinion. If there's any heaven, I'll give it there. But there'll be no discussion in heaven. Hell is the only place where mental improvement will be possible. I have said, it is charged, that the Bible says the world was made in six days. He says, I don't understand Hebrew. The Bible says the world was made in six days. God didn't work nights. Evening and morning were the first day. God rested on the seventh day and sanctified it. That, they say, didn't mean days. It meant good whiles. He made the world in six good whiles. Adam was made, I think, along about Saturday. If the account is correct, it's only six thousand years since man made his appearance. We know that to be false. A few years ago, a gentleman who was going to California in the cars met a minister. They came to the place called the Sink of the Humboldt, the most desolate place in the world. Just imagine perdition with the fire out. The traveler asked the minister whether God made the earth in six days, and the minister said he did. Then don't you think, said he, he could have put in another day's work to great advantage right here? I am charged, too, with saying that the sun was not made till the fourth day, whereas, according to the Bible, Vegetation began on the third day, before there was any light. But Mr. Talmadge says there was light without the sun. They got light, he says, from the crystallization of rocks. A nice thing to raise a crop of corn by. There may have been volcanoes, he says. How'd you like to farm it and depend on volcanic glare to raise a crop? That's what they call religious science. God won't damn a man for things like that. What else? The Aurora Borealis, a great cucumber country. It's strange he never thought of glowworms. Imagine it, a Presbyterian divine gravely saying vegetation could grow by the light of the crystallization of rocks by the light of volcanoes in other worlds, probably now extinct. He says of me, too, in his pulpit, that I was in favor of the circulation of immoral literature. Let me tell you the truth. Several gentlemen, so-called, were trying to exclude from the males books called infidel. I said the law should be modified. It is impossible for anybody to reach the depth of one who will print or circulate obscene books. One of my objections to the Bible is that it contains obscene stories. Any book couched in decent language should have the liberty of the United States mails. Where books are immoral and obscene, I say burn them, and have always said it. 
Mr. Talmadge said what he knew to be untrue. He said it out of hatred, and because he cannot answer the arguments I have urged. I believe in pure books and pure literature, but when a god writes there is no excuse for him. In Shakespeare we say obscene things are impure, we do not say they are inspired. That I have falsified the records of the Bible showing the period of Jewish slavery is another of the charges against me. That slavery extended over a period of 215 years, and he proceeded to substantiate this statement by going through a long and somewhat complicated genealogical table. If I made any misstatement, I was misled by the New Testament. Mr. Talmadge may settle with St. Paul. If you can depend on what my friend Paul says, the Jews, in 215 years, increased from 70 persons till they had 600,000 men of war. I know it isn't so, and so does any man who knows anything. For such an increase as this, each woman must have borne somewhat over 57 children, and every child lived. The next charge is that I have laughed at holy things. Holy things! The priest always says, now don't laugh, look solemn, this is no laughing matter. There's nothing a priest hates like mirthfulness. He despises a smile. I read in the Bible that God gave a recipe to Aaron for making hair oil, and said if anybody made any like it, kill him. Well, I don't believe it. The penalty for infringing on that patent was death. Do you believe an infinite God gave a recipe for hair oil? Is it possible for absurdity to go beyond that? That's what they call a holy thing. And water for baptism. Do you believe God will look for this watermark on the soul? The next charge is that I misquote the scriptures. That's because I don't know Hebrew. Why didn't he write to me in English? If he wishes to hold a gentleman responsible, why doesn't he address him in his native tongue? Why write his word in such a way that hundreds of thousands make their living explaining it? If I'd only understood Hebrew, I would have known God didn't make Eve out of a rib. He made her out of Adam's side. How did he get it out? Well, I suppose he cut it out with a kind of splinter of his omnipotence. Then our mother was made from a rib. When you consider the material used, it was the most successful job ever done. There's even a serpent in the Bible that knows a language. <sighs> it won't do. Sin, how did it come into the world? Where did the serpent come from? He was wicked. Adam's sin did not make him bad. Then there was sin in the world before Adam. There's no sense in it, not a particle. Then Talmadge touches me upon the flood. His flood didn't come to America because America was not discovered then. He says it was a partial flood. Then why did they have to take any birds in the ark? How did Noah get the animals in the ark? Talmadge says it was through the instinct to get out of the rain. According to the Bible, they went in before the rain began. Dr. Scott says the angels helped carry them in. Imagine an angel with an animal under each wing. It must have rained 800 feet a day for 40 days. Why does Talmadge try to explain a miracle? The beauty of a miracle is it cannot be explained. The moment the church begins to explain, the church is gone. All it's got to do is swear it is so. The ark landed on Ararat, which is 17,000 feet high. There was only one window, 22 inches square. Talmadge says the window ran clear around the ark. The Bible doesn't say so. That's Brooklyn. That's no Bible. If the Bible account is true, the ark must have struck bottom on the top of a mountain. Would any but a God of mercy and kindness people a world 
and then drown them all? A god cruel enough to drown his own children ought not to have the impudence to tell me how to bring up mine. Why did he save eight of the same kind of people to take a fresh start? Why didn't he make a fresh lot, kill his snake, and give his children a fair show? It won't do. Talmadge says the Bible does not favor polygamy and slavery. There was room enough on the table of stone for saying man should only have one wife and no slaves. If not, God might have written it on the other side. David and Solomon were pursued of God, but they had a pretty good time of it. Most anybody would be willing to be pursued that way. There is not a word in the Old Testament against slavery or polygamy. Frederick Douglass, a slave in Maryland, is the greatest man that state ever produced. He was enslaved by Christians. Why did God pay so much attention to blasphemers and so little to slaveholders and robbers? I am opposed to any God that was ever in favor of slavery. The Bible upholds polygamy, and that's the reason I don't uphold the Bible. The most glorious temple ever erected is the home. That's my church. I've misquoted the story of Jonah, Talmadge says. When somebody had been guilty of blasphemy, the winds rose. They tried to get Jonah ashore, but couldn't do it. The sea waxed. He was swallowed by a whale. The people of Minerva wrapped all their cattle up in sackcloth. And if anything would have pleased God, I should think that would. Jonah sat under a gourd, and God made a worm out of some omnipotence he had left over, and set it to work on the ground. Talmadge doesn't think Jonah was in the whale's belly, he said in his mouth. Well, judging from the doctor's photograph, that explanation would be quite natural to him. He says he might have been in the whale's stomach and avoided the action of the gastric juice by walking up and down. Imagine Jonah sitting on a back tooth, leaning against the upper jaw, longingly looking through the open mouth for signs of land. But that's scripture, and you've got to believe it or be damned. Let me say his brother preachers will not thank Talmadge for his explanations. I don't believe it, and if I am to be damned for it, I'll accept it cheerfully. They say I was defeated for governor of Illinois because I was an infidel, and that I am an infidel because I was defeated. That's logic. Now I'll tell you, they asked me whether I was an infidel, and I said I was. I was defeated. I preserved my manhood and lost an office. If everybody were as frank as I was, some men now in office would be private citizens. I would rather be what I am than hold any office in the world and be a slimy hypocrite. Next they say I slandered my parents because I do not believe what they believed. My father at one time believed the Bible to be the inspired word of God. He was an honorable man and told me to read the Bible for myself and be honest. He lived long enough to believe that the Old Testament was not the word of God. He had not in his life as much happiness as I have in one year. I hope my children will dishonor me by being nearer right than I am. If I have made a mistake, I want my children to correct it. My mother died when I was two years old. Were she living tonight, or if she does live, she would say, Be absolutely true to yourself and preserve your manhood. If Talmadge had been born in Constantinople, he would have been a dervish. He is what he is because he can't help it. His head is just that shape. I am taking away the hope and consolation of the world, he says. His consolation is that ninety-nine out of every hundred are going to hell. 
His church was founded by John Calvin, a murderer. Better have no heaven than a hell. I would rather God would commit suicide this minute than that a single soul should go to hell. I want no Presbyterian consolation. I want no foreordination, no consolation, no damnation. Colonel Ingersoll concluded with a few remarks about the Bible women, saying that women today are as true to the gallows as Mary Magdalene was to the cross. Wherever there are women, there are heroines. Shakespeare's women are vastly superior to the Bible women. I am accused of putting out the lighthouses on the shores of the other world. The Christians are trimming invisible wicks and pouring in allegorical oil. The Christian is willing wife. Children and parents shall burn if only he can sing and have a harp. Mr. Talmadge can see countless millions burn in hell without decreasing the length of his orthodox smile. End of Ingersoll's Lecture on Talmadian Theology Second Lecture Ingersoll's Lecture on Talmadian Theology Third Lecture We must judge people somewhat by their creeds. Mr. Talmadge is a Calvinist, and he therefore regards every human being who has been born only once as totally depraved. He thinks that God never made a single creature that didn't deserve to be damned the minute he finished him. So everyone who opposes Mr. Talmadge is infamous. The generosity of an agnostic is meanness. His honesty is larceny, and his love is hate. Talmadge is a consistent follower of Calvin and Knox, and a consistent worshipper of the Jehovah of the ancient Jews. I oppose not him but his creed, because it tends to crush out the natural tendencies in men to joyousness and goodness. There is something good in every human being, and there is something bad. There are no perfect saints and no totally bad persons. There is the seed of goodness in every human heart and the capacity for improvement in every human soul. Isn't it possible for a man who acts like Christ to be saved, whatever be his belief? Cannot a soul be infinitely generous? And can any God damn such a soul? If Mr. Talmadge's creed be true, nearly all the great and glorious men of the past are burning today. If it be true, the greatest man England has produced in a hundred years is in hell. The world is poorer since I spoke here last, for Darwin has passed away. He was a true child of nature, one who knew more about his mother than any other child she had. Yet he was not a Calvinist. He did not get his inspiration from any book, but from every star in the heavens, from the insect in the sunbeam, from the flowers in the meadows, and from the everlasting rocks. If the doctrine of the Calvinists is true, what right had any one to ask an unbeliever to fight for his country in the Civil War? What right has a believer to buy an unbelieving substitute when some day he will look over the edge of heaven and pointing downward would say to a friend, That is my substitute, blistering there. Mr. Talmadge says that my mind is poisoned, and that the reason why all infidels' minds are poisoned is that they don't believe the Jew Bible. Let us see whether it is worth believing. I deny that an infinitely merciful God would protect slavery or would uphold polygamy, which pollutes the sweetest words in language. I will not believe that God told men to exterminate their fellow men, to plunge the sword into women's breasts and into the hearts of tender babes. I am opposed to the Jew Bible because it is bad. I don't deny that there are many good passages in it, nor that among all those thorns there are some roses. 
I admit that many Christians are doing all they can to idealize the frightful things in the Old Testament. It is the protest of human nature. Now they tell me that this book is inspired. Let us see what inspired means. If it means anything, it is that the thoughts of God, through the instrumentality of men, constitute this Jew Bible, and that these thoughts were written. Now just suppose that some voice whispered in your ear, how would you know it was God's? How did these gentlemen of old know it was God who was talking to them? If anyone now told you that God whispered in his ear, you wouldn't believe him. Why? Because you know him. Why are we asked to believe those ancient gentlemen? Because we don't know them. Another reason, according to Mr. Talmadge, why the Jew Bible is inspired, is that prophecies in it have been fulfilled. How do we know that the prophecies were not fulfilled before they were written? They are so vague that you can't tell what was prophesied. If you will read the Jew Bible carefully, you will see that there was not a line, not a word, prophesying the coming of Christ. Catholics were right in saying that if the Jew Bible was to be kept in awe, it must be kept from the people. Protestants are wrong in letting the people read it. Another argument of Mr. Talmadge for the inspiration of the Bible is that the Jews have been kept as a wandering, persecuted race to fulfill the prophecies of the Old Testament. I don't believe an infinitely merciful God would persecute a race for thousands of years to use them as witnesses. Christian hate has not allowed the Jews to earn a living, or at least to practice a profession, and now, by a kind of poetic justice, the Jews control the money of the world. Emperors go to their bankers with hat in hand and beg them to discount their notes. This is because God has cursed the Jews. Only a little while ago, Christians have robbed Hebrews, stripped them naked, turned them into the streets, and pointed to them as a fulfillment of divine prophecy. If you want to know the difference between some Jews and some Christians, compare the address of Felix Adler with the sermon of the Reverend Dr. Talmadge. Mr. Talmadge thinks that the light of every burning Jewish home in Russia throws light upon the gospel. Every wound in a Jewish breast is to him a mouth to proclaim the divine inspiration of the Bible. Every Jewish maiden violated is another fulfillment of God's holy word. What do these horrid persecutions prove except the barbarity of Christians. Next it is said that martyrs prove the truth of the Bible. Mr. Talmadge affirms that no man ever died cheerfully for a lie. Why, men have gone cheerfully to their death for believing that a wafer was God's flesh. Thousands have died for their belief in Mohammed. Men have died because they believed in immersion. Either Mr. Talmadge is a Catholic, a Mohammedan, a Baptist, or else he believes that these thousands died for lies. Every religion has had its martyrs, and every religion cannot be true. Then it is said that miracles provide the inspiration of the Bible. But it is impossible by the human senses to establish a violation of nature's laws. When the Hebrews threw down the sticks before Pharaoh and they became snakes, did he believe? No, because he was there. After the Jews had been led through the desert, and had been fed with bread rained from heaven, had been clothed in indestructible pantaloons, and had quenched their thirst with water that followed them over the mountains and through the sands, when they saw Jehovah wrapped in the smoke of Sinai, they still had more faith in a calf that they could make than anything Jehovah could give them. It was so with the miracles of Christ. Not twenty people were converted by one of them. In fact, human testimony cannot substantiate a miracle. Take the miracle about the bears which ate the children who laughed at the bald-headed old prophet. What do you suppose Mr. Talmadge would say that meant? 
Why, first, that children ought to respect preachers, and second, that God is kind to animals. Nearly every miracle in the Old Testament is wrought in the interest of slavery, polygamy, creed, or lust. I wish by denying them to rescue the reputation of Jehovah from the assaults of the Bible. Who are the witnesses to the truth of the narratives of the Jews' Bible? Eusebius was one. He lived in the reign of Constantine and said that the tracks of Pharaoh's chariots could be seen perfectly preserved in the sands of the Red Sea. He was the man who forged the passage in Josephus which speaks about the coming of Christ. Good witness, isn't he? Another one was Polycarp. We don't know much about him. He suffered martyrdom in the reign of Marcus Aurelius. And when the fire wouldn't burn and he looked like gold through it, a heathen was so mad about it that he ran his sword through Polycarp. The blood gushed out and quenched the fire, while the martyr's soul flew up to heaven in the form of a dove. And that's all we know about Polycarp. To know how much reliance should be placed upon the judgment of such trustworthy witnesses, we should look at what some of their beliefs were. They thought that the world was flat, that the phoenix story was true, that the stars had souls and sinned, and one said there were four gospels because there were four winds and four corners of the earth. He might have added that it was also because a donkey has four legs. As far as the argument drawn from the sufferings of the martyrs is concerned, the speaker said that thousands upon thousands of men had died as cheerfully in defense of the Koran as Christians had died in defense of the Bible. Their heroic suffering simply proved that they were sinners in their beliefs, not that those beliefs were true. This argument, as advanced by Mr. Talmadge, proves too much. Every religion on the face of the globe has had its martyrs, but all religions cannot be true. Men do die cheerfully for falsehoods when they believe them to be true. The question of miracles was discussed at some length, and Colonel Ingersoll declared it was impossible to establish by any human evidence that a miracle had ever been performed. Pharaoh was not convinced by the alleged miracle performed by Aaron of turning a stick into a serpent. Why? Because he was there, and no such miracle was ever done. No twenty people were convinced by the reported miracles of Christ, and yet people of the nineteenth century were coolly asked to be convinced on hearsay by miracles which those who are supposed to have seen them refuse to credit. It won't do. The laws of nature never have been interrupted, and they never will be. All the books in the universe will never convince a thinking man that miracles have been performed. The lecture was sprinkled throughout with the satirical wit for which Colonel Ingersoll is famous, and concluded by the enumeration of a long list of unscientific facts and events recorded in the Bible. End of Ingersoll's Lecture on Talmagian Theology Third Lecture This has been a LibriVox recording, read for you by Ted DeLorme in Fort Mill, South Carolina, on May seventh, two 2009. Section 13, Ingersoll's Lecture on Religious Intolerance. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ingersoll's Lecture on Religious Intolerance from the book Lectures of Colonel Robert Green Ingersoll, Volume 2. How anybody ever came to the conclusion that there was any God who demanded that you should feel sorrowful and miserable and bleak one-seventh of the time is beyond my comprehension. Neither can I conceive how they say that one-seventh of time is holy. That day is the most sacred day on which the most good has been done for mankind. 
Now there was a time among the Jews when, if a man violated the Sabbath, they would kill him. They said God told them to do it. I think they were mistaken. If not, if any God did tell them to kill him, then I think he was mistaken. I hope the time will come when every man can spend the Sabbath just as he pleases, provided he does not interfere with the happiness of others. I would fight just as earnestly that the Christian may go to church as that the infidel may have the right to spend the Sabbath as he wishes. Are the people who go to church the only good people? Are there not a great many bad people who go to church? Not a bank in Pittsburgh will lend a dollar to the man who belongs to the church without security, quicker than to the man who don't go to church. Now I believe that all laws upon the statute book should be enforced. I do not blame anybody in this town. I am perfectly willing that every preacher in this town should preach. They are employed to preach, and to preach a certain doctrine, and if they don't preach that doctrine, they will be turned out. I have no objection to that. But I want the same privilege to express my views, and what is the difference whether the man pays the day he goes in, or pays for it the week before by subscription? What would the church people think if the theatrical people should attempt to suppress the churches? What harm would it do to have an opera here tonight? It would elevate us more than to hear ten thousand sermons on the world that never dies. There is more practical wisdom in one of the plays of Shakespeare than in all the sacred books ever written. What wrong would there be to see one of those grand plays on Sunday? There was a time when the church would not allow you to cook on Sunday. You had to eat your victuals cold. There was a time when they thought the more miserable you feel, the better God feels. There are sixty-odd thousand preachers in the United States. Some people regard them as a necessary evil some as an unnecessary evil. There are sixty-odd thousand churches in the United States, and it does seem to me that with all the wealth on their side, with all the good people on their side, with providence on their side, with all these advantages, they ought to let us at least have the right to speak our thoughts. The history of the world shows me that the right has not always prevailed. When you see innocent men chained to the stake and the flames licking their flesh, it is natural to ask, why does God permit this? If you see a man in prison with the chains eating into his flesh simply for loving God, you've got to ask, why does not a just God interfere? You've got to meet this. It won't do to say that it will all come out for the best. That may do very well for God, but it's awful hard on the man. Where was the God that permitted slavery for two hundred years in these United States? The history of the world shows that when a mean thing was done, man did it. When a good thing was done, man did it. But there was a time when there was a drought, and this tribe of savages, with their false notions of religion, says, Somebody has been wicked. Somebody has been lecturing on Sunday. Then the tribe hunted out the wicked man. They said, You've got to stop. We cannot allow you to continue your wickedness, which brings punishment upon the whole of us. What is the reason they allow me to speak tonight? Because the Christians are not as firm in their belief now as they were a thousand years ago. The lukewarmness and hypocrisy of Christians now permit me to speak tonight. If they felt as they did a thousand years ago, they would kill me. 
So religious persecution was born of the instinct of self-defense. Is there any duty we owe to God? Can we help him? Can we add to his glory or happiness? They tell me this God is infinitely wise. I cannot add to his wisdom. Infinitely happy, I cannot add to his happiness. What can I do? Maybe he wants me to make prayers that won't be answered. I cannot see any relation that can exist between the finite and the infinite. I acknowledge that I am under obligations to my fellow man. We owe duties to our fellow man. And what? Simply to make them happy. The only good is happiness, and the only evil is misery or unhappiness. Only those things are right that tend to increase the happiness of man. Only those things are wrong which tend to increase the misery of man. That is the basis of right and wrong. There never would have been the idea of wrong except that man can inflict sufferings upon others. Utility, then, is the basis of the idea of right and wrong. The church tells us that this world is a school to prepare us for another, that it is a place to build up character. Well, if that is the only way character can be developed, it is bad for children who die before they get any character. What would you think of a schoolmaster who would kill half his pupils the first day? Now I read the Bible, and I find that God so loved this world that he made up his mind to damn most of us. I have read this book, and what shall I say of it? I believe it is generally better to be honest. Now I don't believe the Bible. Had I not better say so? They say that if you do, you will regret it when you come to die. If that be true, I know a great many religious people who will have no cause to regret it. They don't tell their honest convictions about the Bible. There are two great arguments of the church, the great man argument and the deathbed. They say the religion of your fathers is good enough. Why should your father object to your inventing a better plow than he had? They say to one, do you know more than all the theologians dead? Being a perfectly modest man, I say I think I do. Now we have come to the conclusion that every man has a right to think. Would God give a bird wings and make it a crime to fly? Would he give me brains and make it a crime to think? Any God that would damn one of his children for the expression of his honest thought wouldn't make a decent thief. When I read a book and don't believe it, I ought to say so. I will do so, and take the consequence like a man. And so I object to paying for the support of another man's belief. I am in favor of the taxation of all church property. If that property belongs to God, he is able to pay the tax. If we exempt anything, let us exempt the home of the widow and orphan. A voice here interrupted the speaker. Colonel Ingersoll, what did the gentleman say? Oh, he's drunk. Colonel Ingersoll, I didn't think any Christian ought to get drunk and come here to disturb us. The speaker resumed. The church has today six hundred million or seven hundred million dollars of property in this country. It must cost two million a week, that is to say five hundred a minute, to run these churches. You give me this money, and if I don't do more good with it than four times as many churches, I'll resign. Let them make the churches attractive, and they'll get more hearers. They will have less empty pews if they have less empty heads in the pulpit. The time will come when the preacher will be a teacher. 
admitting that the Bible is the book of God, is that his only good job? Will not a man be damned as quick for denying the equator as denying the Bible? Will he not be damned as quick for denying geology as for denying the scheme of salvation? When the Bible was first written, it was not believed. Had they known as much about science as we know now, that Bible would not have been written. Colonel Ingersoll next gave his views of the Puritans, declared that they left Holland to escape persecution, and came here to persecute others. He referred to the persecutions heaped upon those of other religious belief by the Puritans, paid the Catholics the compliment to say that Maryland, which they ruled, was the first colony to enact a law tolerating religious views not held by themselves, and went on to explain that God was never mentioned in the Constitution of the United States, because each colony had a different religious belief, and each sect preferred to have God not mentioned at all than to having another religious belief than their own recognized. In 1876, said the speaker, our forefathers retired God from politics. They said all power comes from the people. They kept God out of the Constitution, and allowed each state to settle the question for itself. The present laws of different states were neatly reviewed so far as they relate to the prevention of infidels giving testimony, and to religious intolerance in any way, and these features were all branded and discussed as a gigantic evil. The lecture was attentively listened to by the immense audience from beginning to the end, and the speaker's most blasphemous fights were the most loudly applauded. End of Ingersoll's Lecture on Religious Intolerance This is a LibriVox recording, read for you by Ted DeLorme, in Fort Mill, South Carolina, on May twentieth, two 2009. Section 14, Ingersoll's Lecture on the Hereafter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ingersoll's Lecture on the Hereafter, from the book Lectures of Colonel Robert Green Ingersoll, Volume 2. My friends, I tell you tonight, as I have probably told many of you dozens of times, that the orthodox doctrine of eternal punishment in the hereafter is an infamous one. I have no respect for the man who preaches it or pretends to you he believes it. Neither have I any respect for the man who will pollute the imagination of innocent childhood with that infamous lie." and I have no respect for the man who will deliberately add to the sorrows of this world with this terrible dogma. No respect for the man who endeavors to put that infinite cloud and shadow over the heart of humanity. I will be frank with you and say, I hate the doctrine, I despise it, I defy it, I loathe it, and what man of sense does not? The idea of a hell was born of revenge and brutality on the one side, and arrant cowardice on the other. In my judgment, the American people are too brave, too generous, too magnanimous, too humane to believe in that outrageous doctrine of eternal damnation. For a great many years the learned intellects of Christendom have been examining into the religions of other countries and other ages in the world, the religions of the myriads who have passed away. They examined into the religions of Egypt, the religion of Greece, that of Rome and the Scandinavian countries. In the presence of the ruins of those religions, the learned men of Christendom insisted that those religions were baseless, false, and fraudulent. But they have all passed away. Now, while this examination was being made, 
the christianity of our day applauded and when the learned men got through with the religion of other countries they turned their attention to our religion and by the same methods by the same mode of reasoning and the same arrangements that they used with the old religions they were overturning the religion of our day how is that because every religion in this world is the work of man every book that was ever written was written by man man existed before books if otherwise we might reasonably admit that there was such a thing as a sacred bible i wish to call your attention to another thing man never had an original idea and he never will have one except it be supplied to him by his surroundings nature gave man every idea that he ever had in the world and nature will continue to give man his ideas so long as he exists no man can conceive of anything the hint of which he has not received from the surroundings and there is nothing on this earth coming from any other sphere whatever as i have before said man has produced every religion in the world why is this because each generation sends forth the knowledge and belief of the people at the time it was made and in no book is there any knowledge formed except just at the time it was written barbarians have produced barbarian religions and always will produce them they have produced and always will produce ideas and belief in harmony with their surroundings and all the religions of the past were produced by barbarians we are making religions every day that is to say we are constantly changing them adapting them to our purposes and the religion of today is not the religion of a few months or a year ago well what changes these religions science does it education does it the growing heart of man does it some men have nothing else to do but produce religions science is constantly changing them if we are cursed with such barbarian religions today for our religions are really barbarous what will they be an hundred or a thousand years hence but friends we are making inroads upon orthodoxy that orthodox christians are painfully aware of and what think you will be left of their fearful doctrines fifty or a hundred years from tonight what will become of their endless hell their doctrine of the future anguish of the soul their doctrine of the eternal burning and never-ending gnashing of teeth man will discard the idea of such a future because there is now a growing belief in the justice of a supreme being do you not know that every religion in the world has declared every other religion a fraud yes we all know it that is the time all religions tell the truth each of the other now do you want to know why this is suppose mr johnson should tell mr jones that he saw a corpse rise from the grave and that when he first saw it it was covered with loathsome worms and that while he was looking at it it suddenly was reclothed in healthy beautiful flesh and then suppose jones should say to johnson well now i saw that same thing myself i was in a graveyard once and i saw a dead man rise and walk away as if nothing had ever happened to him johnson opens wide his eyes and says to jones jones you are a confounded liar and jones says to johnson you are an unmitigated liar no i'm not you lie yourself no i say you lie each knew the other lied because each man knew he lied himself thus when a man says 
I was upon Mount Sinai for the benefit of my health, and there I met God, who said to me, Stand aside, you, and let me drown these people. And the other man says to him, I was upon a mountain, and there I met the supreme Brahma. And Moses steps in and says, That is not true, and contends that the other man never did see Brahma, and the other man swears that Moses never saw God, and each man utters a deliberate falsehood, and immediately after speaks truth. Therefore, each religion has charged every other religion with having been an unmitigated fraud. Still, if any man had ever seen a miracle himself, he would be prepared to believe that another man had seen the same or a similar thing. Whenever a man claims to have been cognizant of or to have seen a miracle, he either utters a falsehood or he is an idiot. Truth relies upon the unerring course of the laws of nature and upon reason. Observe, we have a religion, that is, many people have. I make no pretensions to having a religion myself. Possibly you do not. I believe in living for this beautiful world, in living for the present, today, living for this very hour. And while I do live, to make everybody happy that I can. I cannot afford to squander my short life, and what little talent I am blessed with, in studying up and projecting schemes to avoid that seething lake of fire and brimstone. Let the future take care of itself, and when I am required to pass over on the other side, I am ready and willing to stand my chances with you howling Christians. We have in this country a religion which men have preached for about 1,800 years, and men have grown wicked just in proportion as their belief in that religion has grown strong, and just in proportion as they have ceased to believe in it, men have become just, humane, and charitable. And if they believed in it tonight as they believed, for instance, at the time of the Immaculate Puritan Fathers, I would not be permitted to talk here in the city of New York. It is from the coldness and infidelity of the churches that I get my right to preach, and I thank them for it, and I say it to their credit. As I have said, we have a religion. What is it? In the first place, they say this vast universe was created by a god. I don't know, and you don't know, whether it was or not. Also, if it had not been for the first sin of Adam, they say there would never have been any devil in this world, and if there had been no devil, there would have been no sin, and if no sin, no death. As for myself, I am glad there is death in the world, for that gives me a chance. Somebody has to die to give me room, and when my turn comes I am willing to let someone else take my place. But if there is a being who gave me this life, I thank him from the bottom of my heart, because this life has been a joy and a pleasure to me. Further, because of this first sin of Adam, they say, all men are consigned to eternal perdition. But in order to save man from that frightful hell of the hereafter, Christ came to this world and took upon himself flesh, and in order that we might know the road to eternal salvation, he gave us a book called the Bible. And wherever that Bible has been read, Men have immediately commenced throttling each other, and wherever that Bible has been circulated, they have invented inquisitions and instruments of torture, and commenced hating each other with all their hearts. 
Then we are told that this Bible is the foundation of civilization. But I say it is the foundation of hell and damnation. And we never shall get rid of that dogma until we get rid of the idea that the book is inspired. Now what does the Bible teach? I am not going to ask this preacher or that preacher what the Bible teaches, but the question is, ought a man be sent to an eternal hell for not believing this Bible to be the work of a merciful God? A very few people read it now. Perhaps they should read it, and perhaps not. If I wanted to believe it, I should never read a word of it, never look upon its pages. I would let it lie on its shelf until it rotted. Still, perhaps we ought to read it in order to see what is read in schools, that our children might become charitable and good, to be read to our children that they may get ideas of mercy, charity, humanity, and justice. Oh, yes. Now read. I will make mine arrows drunk with blood, and my sword shall devour flesh. Deuteronomy 32, 42. Very good for a merciful God. That thy foot may be dipped in the blood of thine enemies, and the tongue of the dogs in the same. Psalms 68, 24. Merciful being, I will quote several more choice bits from this inspired book, although I have several times made use of them. But the Lord thy God shall deliver them unto thee, and shall destroy them with a mighty destruction, until they be destroyed. And he shall deliver their kings into thine hand, and thou shalt destroy their name from under heaven. There shall no man be able to stand before thee, until thou have destroyed them. Deuteronomy 7, 23 and 24. And Joshua did unto them as the Lord bade him. He hoed their horses and burnt their chariots with fire. And Joshua at that time turned back and took Hazor and smote the king thereof with the sword. For Hazor before time was the head of all those kingdoms and all the cities of those kings, and all the kings of them did Joshua take, and smote them with the edge of the sword, and he utterly destroyed them as Moses the servant of the Lord commanded. And they smote all the souls that were therein with the edge of the sword, utterly destroying them. There was not any left to breathe and he burnt Hazor with fire. Do not forget that these things were done by the command of God. But as for the cities that stood still in their strength, Israel burnt none of them, save Hazor only, that did Joshua burn. And all the spoil of those cities and the cattle, the children of Israel took for a prey unto themselves, but every man they smote with the edge of the sword, until they had destroyed them, neither left they any to breathe, as the moral and just God had commanded them. As the Lord commanded Moses his servant, so did Moses command Joshua, and so did Joshua. He left nothing undone of all that the Lord had commanded Joshua. So Joshua took all that land, the hills and all the south country, and all the land of Goshen, and the valley, and the plain and mountain of Israel, and the valley of the same, even from the Mount Halak, that goeth up to Seir, even unto Balgad in the valley of Lebanon under Mount Hermon, and all their kings he took, and smote them, and slew them. Joshua made war a long time on all those kings. There was not a city that made peace with the children of Israel, save the Hevites, the inhabitants of Gibeon, and all the others they took in battle. 
So Joshua took the whole land according to all that the Lord said unto Moses, and Joshua gave it for an inheritance unto Israel, according to their divisions by their tribes. And the land rested from war. Joshua 11, 7 through 23. When thou comest nigh unto a city to fight against it, then proclaim peace unto it. And it shall be, if it make thee answer of peace, and open unto thee, then it shall be that all the people that is found therein shall be tributaries unto thee, and they shall serve thee. And if it will make no peace with thee, but will make war against thee, then thou shalt besiege it. And when the Lord thy God hath delivered it into thine hands, thou shalt smite every male thereof with the edge of the sword. But the women, and the little ones, and the cattle, and all that is in the city, even all the spoil thereof, shalt thou take unto thyself. And thou shalt eat the spoil of thine enemies, which the Lord thy God hath given thee. Thus shalt thou do unto all the cities which are very far off from thee, which are not of the cities of those nations. But of the cities of these people which the Lord thy God doth give thee for an inheritance, thou shalt save alive nothing that breatheth, but thou shalt utterly destroy them. Neither the old man, nor the woman, nor the beautiful maiden, nor the sweet dimpled babe smiling upon the lap of its mother, and he said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, a merciful God indeed, Put every man his sword by his side, and go in and out from gate to gate throughout the camp, and slay every man his brother, and every man his neighbor. Ephesians 32, 29. Now recollect these instructions were given to an army of invasion, and the people who were slayed were guilty of the crime of fighting for their homes and their firesides. Oh, most merciful God! The Old Testament is full of curses, vengeance, jealousy, and hatred, and of barbarity and brutality. Now, do you for one moment believe that these words were written by the most merciful God? Don't pluck from the heart the sweet flower of piety and crush it by superstition. Do not believe that God ever ordered the murder of innocent women and helpless babes. Do not let this superstition turn our heart into stone. When anything is said to have been written by the most merciful God, and the thing is not merciful, that I deny it and say he never wrote it. I will live by the standard of reason, and if thinking in accordance with reason takes me to perdition, then I will go to hell with my reason, rather than to heaven without it. Now does this Bible teach political freedom, or does it teach political tyranny? Does it teach a man to resist oppression? Does it teach a man to tear from the throne of tyranny the crowned thing and robber called king? Let us see. Let every soul be subject to the higher powers, for there is no power but God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Romans 13, 1. Therefore, to must needs be subject not only for wrath, but also for conscience' sake. Romans 8, 4, 4. I deny this wretched doctrine. Wherever the sword of rebellion is drawn to protect the rights of man, I am a rebel. Wherever the sword of rebellion is drawn to give men liberty, to clothe him in all his just rights, I am on the side of that rebellion. Does the Bible give woman her rights? Does it treat woman as she ought to be treated, or is it barbarian? We will see. Let woman learn in silence with all subjection. 1 Timothy 2.11 If a woman should know anything, let her ask her husband. <laughs> Imagine the ignorance of a lady who had only that source of information. But suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. Indeed. And Adam was not deceived, 
but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Poor woman! Here is something from the Old Testament. When thou goest forth to war against thine enemies, and the Lord thy God hath delivered them into thine hands, and thou hast taken them captives, and seest among the captives a beautiful woman, and hast a desire unto her, that thou wouldst have her to be thy wife, then thou shalt bring her home to thine house, and she shall shave her head, and pare her nails. Deuteronomy 21, 10-12 that is self-defense, I suppose. I need not go further in Bible quotations to show that woman throughout the Old Testament is a degraded being, having no rights which her husband, father, brother, or uncle is bound to respect. Still, that is Bible doctrine, and that Bible is the word of a just and omniscient God. Does the Bible teach the existence of devils? Of course it does. Yes, it teaches not only the existence of a good being, but a bad being. This good being has to have a home. That home was heaven. This bad being had to have a home, and that home was hell. This hell is supposed to be nearer to earth than I would care to have it, and to be peopled with spirits, spooks, hobgoblins, and all the fiery shapes with which the imagination of ignorance and fear could people that horrible place. And the Bible teaches the existence of hell and this big devil and all these little devils. The Bible teaches the doctrine of witchcraft and makes us believe that there are sorcerers and witches and that the dead could be raised by the power of sorcery. Does anybody believe it now? Then said Saul unto his servants, Seek me a woman that hath a familiar spirit, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servants said to him, Behold, there is a woman that hath a familiar spirit at Endor. In another place he declares that witchcraft is an abomination unto the Lord. He wants no rivals in this business. Now what does the New Testament teach? Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted forty days and forty nights, he was afterward a-hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command these stones to be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city, and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dost dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Matthew 4, 1-7 through seven. Is it possible that any one can believe that the devil absolutely took God Almighty and put him upon the pinnacle of the temple and endeavored to persuade him to jump down? Is it possible... Again the devil taketh him into an exceedingly high mountain, and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world, and the glory of them, and saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Matthew 4, 8-11 now only the devil must have known at that time that he was God, and God at that time must have known that the other was the devil, who had the impudence to promise God a world in which he did not have a tax title to an inch of land. Now what of the Sabbath, the Lord's day? Why is Sunday the Lord's day? If Sunday alone is the Lord's day, whose day is Monday, Tuesday, Friday, etc.? No matter. The idea that God hates to hear your children laugh on Sunday. On Sunday let your children play games. 
I see a poor man who hasn't money enough to go to a big church, and he has too much independence to go to the little church which the big church built for charity. If he enters the portals of the big church with poor clothes on, the usher approaches him with a severe face, and, brother, I'm sorry, but only high-toned servants of the living God congregate in this church for worship, and with that seedy suit on they cannot admit you. All the seats in this magnificent edifice are owned and represented by solid men, by men of capital. We pay our pastor five thousand dollars a year, the annual eight weeks vacation thrown in, and it would not be profitable for us to seriously encourage the attendance of so insignificant a person as yourself. Just around the corner there is a little cheap church, with a little cheap pastor, where they can dish up hell to you in an approved style, in a style more suitable to your needs and condition, and the dish will not be as expensive to you either. If I had chanced to be that poor man in the seedy garments, and had been endeavoring to serve my Maker for even half a century, I would have felt like muttering audibly, "'You go to hell.' I am not much given to profanity, but when I am sorely aggravated and vexed in spirit, I declare to you that it is such a relief to me, such a solace to my troubled soul, and gives me such heavenly peace, to now and then allow a word or phrase to escape my lips which can serve no other earthly purpose, seemingly, than to render emphatic my otherwise mildly expressed ideas. I make this confession parenthetically, and in a whisper, my friends, trusting you will not allow it to go further. Now I tell you, if you don't want to go to church, go to the woods, and take your wife and children and a lunch with you, and sit down upon the old log and let the children gather flowers, and hear the leaves whispering poems like memories of long ago, and when the sun is about going down, kissing the summits of the distant hills, go home with your hearts filled with throbs of joy and gladness, and the cheeks of your little ones covered with the rose blushes of health. There is more recreation and solid enjoyment in that than putting on your Sunday clothes and going to a canal boat with a steeple on top of it, and listening to a man tell you that your chances are about ninety-nine thousand nine hundred and ninety-nine to one for being eternally damned oh strike with a hand of fire weird musician thy harp strung with apollo's golden hair fill the vast cathedral aisles with symphonies sweet and dim deft toucher of the organ's keys Blow, bugler, blow, until thy silver notes do touch and kiss the moonlit waves, and charm the lovers wandering mid the vine-clad hills. But know your sweetest strains are but discord compared with childhood's happy laugh, the laugh that fills the eyes with light, and every heart with joy. O oh, rippling river of laughter, thou art the blessed boundary line between beasts and men, and every wayward wave of thine doth drown some fretful fiend of care. O oh, laughter, rose-lipped daughter of joy, there are dimples enough in thy cheek to catch and hold and glorify all the tears of grief. Do not make slaves of your children on Sunday. Don't place them in long straight rows like fence posts and, Shh, children, it's Sunday, when by chance you hear a sound or rustle. Let Winsome Johnny have light and air, and let him grow beautiful. Let him laugh until his little sides ache if he feels like it. Let him pinch the cat's tail until the house is in an uproar with his yells. Let him do anything that will make him happy. When I was a little boy, children went to bed when they were not sleepy, and always got up when they were. I would like to see that changed. We may see it some day. It is really easier to wake a child with a kiss than a blow, with kind words than with harshness and a curse. 
Another thing, let the children eat what they want to. Let them commence at whichever end of the dinner they please. They know what they want much better than you do. Nature knows perfectly well what she is about, and if you go a-fooling with her, you may get in trouble. The crime charged to me is this. I insist that the Bible is not the word of God, that we should not whip our children, that we should treat our wives as loving equals, that God never upheld polygamy and slavery. I deny that God ever commanded his generals to slaughter innocent babes and tear and rip open women with the sword of war, that God ever turned Lot's wife into a pillar of salt, although she might have deserved that fate, that God ever made a woman out of a man's or any other animal's rib. And I emphatically deny that God ever signed or sealed a commission appointing his satanic majesty governor-general over an extensive territory popularly styled hell, with absolute power to torture, burn, maim, boil, or roast at his pleasure the victims of his master's displeasure. I deny these things, and for that I am assailed by the clergy throughout the United States." Now, you have read the Bible romance of the fall of Adam. Yes, well, you know that nearly, or quite all, the religions of this world account for the existence of evil by such a story as that. Adam, the miserable coward, informed God that his wife was at the bottom of the whole business. She did tempt me, and I did eat, and then commenced a row, and we have been <laughs> engaged in it ever since. You know what happened to Adam and his wife for her transgressions? In another account of what is said to have been the same transaction, which is the most sensible account of the two, the supreme Brahma concluded, as he had a little leisure, that he would make a world, and a man and a woman. He made the world, the man, and then the woman, and then placed the pair on the island of Ceylon. Bear in mind there were no ribs used in this affair. This island is said to be the most beautiful that the mind of man can conceive of. Such birds you never saw, such songs you never heard, and then such flowers, such verdure. The branches of the trees were so arranged that when the winds swept through, there floated out from every tree melodious strains of music from a thousand aeolian harps. But after Brahma put them there, he said, let them have a period of courtship, for it is my desire and will that true love should forever precede marriage. And with the nightingales singing, and the stars twinkling, and the little brooklets murmuring, and the flowers blooming, and the gentle breezes fanning their brows, they courted and loved. What a sweet courtship! Then Brahma married the happy pair, and remarked, remain here you can be happy on this island and it is my will that you never leave it well after a little while the man became uneasy and said to the wife of his youth i believe i'll look about a little he determined to seek greener pastures he proceeded to the western extremity of the island and discovered a little narrow neck of land connecting the island with the mainland and the devil they had a genuine devil in those days, too, it seems, who was always playing the devil with us, produced a mirage, and over on the mainland were such hills and vales, such dells and dales, such lofty mountains crowned with perpetual snow, such cataracts clad in bows of glory, that he rushed breathlessly back to his wife, exclaiming, Oh, Heva! The country over there is a thousand times better and lovelier than this. Let us migrate. She, woman-like, said, Adami, we must let well enough alone. We have all we want. Let us stay here. But he said, No, we will go. She followed him, and when they came to this narrow neck of land, he took her upon his back and carried her across. But at the instant he put her down, there was a crash, and looking back they discovered that this narrow neck of land had fallen into the sea. The mirage had disappeared, and there was nothing but rocks, 
and sand, and the supreme Brahma cursed them to the lowest hell. Then Adami spoke, and it showed him to be every inch a man. Curse me, but curse not her. It was not her fault. It was mine. Our Adam says with a pusillanimous whine, Curse her, for it is her fault. She tempted me, and I did eat. The world today is teeming with just such cowards. Then said Brahma, I will save her, but not thee. And then spoke his wife, out of the fullness of the love of a heart in which there was enough to make all her daughters rich in holy affection, If thou wilt not spare him, spare neither me. I do not wish to live without him. I love him. Then magnanimously said the Supreme Brahma, I will spare you both, and watch over you and your children forever. Now tell me truly, which is the grander story? The book containing this story is full of good things, and yet Christians style as heathens those who have adopted this book as their guide, and spend thousands of dollars annually in sending missionaries to convert them. It has been too often conceded that because the New Testament contains in many passages a lofty and terse expression of love as the highest duty of man, Christianity must have a tendency to ennoble his nature. But Christianity is like sweetened whiskey and water. It perverts and destroys that which it should nourish and strengthen. Christianity makes an often fatal attack on a man's morality, if he happens to be blessed with any, by substituting for the sentiments of love and duty to our neighbors a sense of obligation of blind obedience to an infinite, mysterious, revengeful, tyrannical God. The real principle of Christian morality is servile obedience to a dangerous power. Dispute the assertions of even your priest as to the requirements, dislikes, desires, and wishes of the Almighty, and you might as well count yourself as lost, sulfurically lost. If you are one of God's chosen, or in other words, have been saved, and are even so fortunate as to attain to the glories and joys of the gold-paved streets of heaven, you are expected in looking over the banisters of heaven down into the abyss of eternal torture, to view with complacency the agonized features of your mother, sister, brother, or infant child, who are writhing in hell, and laugh at their calamity. You are not allowed to carry them a drop of water to cool their parched tongue, and if you are a Christian, you at this moment believe you will enjoy the situation. If a man in a quarrel cuts down his neighbor in his sins, the poor miserable victim goes directly to hell. The murderer may reasonably count on a lease of a few weeks of life, interviews his pastor, confesses the crime, repents, accepts the grace of God, is forgiven, and then smoothly and gently slides from the rudely constructed scaffold into a haven of joy and bliss, there to sing the praises of the Lamb of God for ever and ever. Poor, unfortunate victim! Happy murderer! Ah! What a beautiful religion humanitarianism and charity might become. The following incident, showing Colonel Ingersoll's disposition to practice what he preaches whenever the opportunity presents itself, we have never before seen in print. One day, during the winter of 1863-4, when the colonel had a law office in Peoria, Illinois, and before the close of the late War of the Rebellion, a thinly clad, middle-aged, ladylike woman came into his office and asked assistance. "'My good woman, why do you ask it?' "'Sir, my husband is a private in the Illinois Infantry, and stationed somewhere in Virginia, but I do not know where, as I have not heard from him for nearly six months, although previous to that time I seldom failed to get a letter from him as often as once a week, and whenever he received his pay the most of his money came to me.' To tell the truth, I do not know whether he is living or not, but one thing I do know, I do not hear from him. 
i have seven children to provide for but no money in the house not a particle of bread in the pantry nor a lump of coal in the shed and the landlord threatening to turn us out in the storm the city pledged itself to give wives a certain sum monthly providing they consented to their husbands responding to the call of the president for troops but disregarding these pledges we and our children are left to starve and freeze and to be turned out of our houses and homes by relentless landlords now sir can you tell me what i am to do the colonel drew his bandana from his greatcoat pocket lightly touched his eyes with it and rising to his feet pointed to a chair sit down madam and remain till i return i will be back in a few minutes he picked up a half sheet of legal cap and a pencil and departed for the law and other offices of the building of which there were several entering the first that appeared good morning smith give me half a dollar well now colonel you are never mind if i am i must have it it came he entered another hello colonel what's new i want a half dollar from you what for none of your business i want the money he got it he entered a third hello bob anything new on it never mind i must have fifty cents but but nothing jones give me what i ask for of course he got what he asked for so on through fourteen offices from which he obtained seven dollars returning to his office he put his hand in his own pocket and drew forth a five dollar note and handed the woman twelve dollars take this my good woman and make it go as far as you can if you obtain relief from no other source call on me again and i will do the best i can for you and still colonel ingersoll is styled by hellfire advocates an infidel atheist dog to do so sweet a thing as to love our neighbors as we love ourselves to strive to attain to as perfect a spirit as a golden rule would bring us into to make virtue lovely by living it grandly and nobly and patiently the outgrowth of a brotherhood not possible in this world where men are living away from themselves and trampling justice and mercy and forgiveness under their feet speaking of the different religions of course they are represented by the different churches and the best hold of the churches and the surest way of giving totally depraved humanity a realizing sense of their utterly lost condition is to talk and preach hell with all its horrible terrible concomitants true the different priests advocate the doctrine only when they see that it is the only thing to rouse the sinners from their lethargy for where is the man who will not accept the grace of jesus christ if he becomes convinced that his state in the hereafter is a terrible one the ministers of the different churches know full well which side of their bread is buttered a priest is a divinity among his people a man around whom his parishioners throw a glamour of sanctity and one who can do no wrong albeit his chief and growing characteristics are tyranny arrogancy self-conceit deception bigotry and superstition tyrannical do i call them most assuredly suppose for example the methodist or presbyterian church had the power to decide whether you or i or any other man should be a methodist or presbyterian and we should decline to follow the path pointed out to us or either of us what i solemnly and candidly ask you would be the result our fate would be more terrible than their endless hell the inquisition would rise again in all its horrid blackness instruments of torture would darken our vision on every hand but thank god not that terrible being whom christians would have us believe as our maker this is a free land free as the air we breathe and you and i can partake of the orthodox waters of life freely or we can let them alone when i see a man perched upon a pedestal called a pulpit a man who is one of nature's noblemen physically and fully able to breast the storms of life and earn his honest living 
telling his hearers with perspiring brow and all his might and main of the terrors of the seething cauldron of hell and how certain it is that they are to be unceremoniously dumped therein to be boiled through all ages yet never boiled done unless they seek salvation when i look upon that man honor bright i pity him for i cannot help comparing him with the lower animals there is a reaction and i feel an utter contempt for him for he may know when he declares hell is a reality that he is lying now of the deception of the preacher at the close of a sermon in an orthodox church rev mr solemn face steps to the side of brother everbright who has been absent from the brimstone mill for several months ah brother everbright how do you do long time since i have seen you how's your family quite well is it well with thee to-day rather lukewarm eh sorry sorry well brother can you do something for us financially to-day our people think my pulpit is too common and say a couple of hundred will put it in good shape and make it desirable and attractive can you contribute a few dollars to the fund well brother solemn face for four long months i have been ill not a day's work have i done and not a cent of money have i that i can call my own next year i trust i can do something for the cause of my maker ah and brother solemn face's face assumes a terrible look of disappointment and he is gone in a moment out upon such a fraud the pulpits of the land are full of them the world is cursed with them they possess all the elements of vagabonds deadbeats falsifiers beggars vultures hyenas and jackals in past ages the cross has been in partnership with the sword and the religion of christ was established by murderers tyrants and hypocrites i want you to know that the church carried the black flag and i ask you what must have been the civilizing influence of such a religion of all the selfish things in this world it is one man wanting to get to heaven caring nothing what becomes of the rest of mankind saying if i can only get my little soul in i have always noticed that the people who have the smallest souls make the most fuss about getting them saved here is what we are taught by the church of today we are taught by them that fathers and mothers can all be happy in heaven no matter who may be in hell that the husband could be happy there with the wife that would have died for him at any moment of his life in hell but they say hell we don't believe in fire i don't think you understand me what we believe in now is remorse what will you have remorse for for the mean things you have done when you are in hell will you have any remorse for the mean things you have done when you are in heaven or will you be so good that then you won't care how you used to be I tell you today that no matter in what heaven you may be, no matter in what star you are spending the summer, if you meet another man whom you have wronged, you will drop a little behind in the tune. And no matter in what part of hell you are, you will meet someone who has suffered, whose nakedness you have clothed, and the fire will cool up a little." according to this christian doctrine you won't care how mean you were once is it a compliment to an infinite god to say that every being he ever made deserved to be damned the minute he had got him done and that he will damn everybody he has not had a chance to make over is it possible that somebody else can be good for me and that this doctrine of the atonement is the only anchor for the human soul we sit by the fireside and see the flames and sparks fly up the chimney everybody happy in the cold wind and sleet beating on the windows and out on the doorstep a mother with a child on her breast freezing how happy it makes a fire that beautiful contrast and we say god is good and there we sit and there she sits and moans, not one night, but forever. 
or we are sitting at the table with our wives and children everybody eating happy and delighted and famine comes and pushes out its shriveled palms and with hungry eyes implores us for a crust how that would increase the appetite and that is the christian heaven don't you see that these infamous doctrines petrify the human heart and i would have every one who hears me swear that he will never contribute another dollar to build another church in which is taught such infamous lies let every man try to make every day a joy and god cannot afford to damn such a man consequently humanity is the only real religion man's inhumanity to man makes countless millions mourn end of ingersoll's lecture on the hereafter this is a librivox recording read for you by ted delorme in fort mill south carolina on june seventh two thousand nine